Previously in the youngest anarchy single player world in Minecraft Nomi Factory, I had created a massive factory with the sole purpose of making an even bigger factory. However this had nearly exhausted my resources. Desperate for new raw materials, I began researching ways to harvest massive amounts of ores using the mod in the game. That was when I stumbled upon the blueprints for this giant purple ball. The Microverse Projector. It could provide me with massive assortments of random resources. But in order to get this ball, I would need to do some stuff. The first order of business was to invade the end island for business purposes and kill the dragon for business purposes. But traversing towards the end was far more complicated in Nomi Factory. Because this lost city's map has no strongholds due to geopolitical reasons. Instead the end is reached through cake induced transdimensional travel. And the end portal cake is made from end stone. But this creates a paradoxical dilemma. How would I get end stone in the first place? This would require using dangerous acids. After creating this stainless steel cylinder to transfer acids, I stole some sulfuric acid from the acid storage to create the infamous phosphoric acid from water and funny dust minerals, which was mixed with various redstone plus glowstone plus aluminum to create this funny yellow shiny ball. This yellow compound is then retorted with lava to create the mouth-watering end stone. In reality end stone could be created from other basic objects that I had thousands of. But I needed the spare luminescence for other purposes. This end stone is triturated and sprinkled on top of metal bars and dough from more metal bars to bake the disgusting but useful end cake. Upon consuming one slice, I was transported to the obsidian podium adjacent to this floating hunk of dandruff with several obsidian columns supporting this flying mass of dragon mass shaped as a dragon. But since I had unlocked unlimited free flight in episode 4 after the glitch incursions, destroying the pillars was a tranquil task. And I could simply maniacally chase the dragon around his homeland with a diamond sword. In retaliation the dragon turned invisible to camouflage with the air. But I saw right through this disguise. After many attacks and hits and swings, the dragon disintegrated, leaving me as the sole proprietor of the end. Now that the end mainland was mine. I began harvesting copious arrangements of obsidian and even more endstone. Because endstone would be a crucial resource later in the game. I also accidentally located a vein of glowy yellow ores. Which was later identified as pitch blend. An ore that supposedly contains yummy uranium in the form of uranite in the form of pitch blend. All of which shall go into my collection, never to be seen again. With this end stone and obsidian I alloyed it with some steel to create the self-explanatory end steel, which had superb electrical properties. This end steel could be used to upgrade the energy system cables to allow for quadruple the amounts of energy transfer. And now that I could power more machines at once, it was time to return to discussing the construction of the microverse projector. After detailed research, I realized that for some reason this deuterium is needed to smelt the microversion compound, which is quite literally and figuratively the building block to create the precious microverse balls. This could only mean one thing. I would have to go to the moon. The moon is related to my ultimate plan for society because it is the only location that contains this yellow gas referred to as deuterium. Spoiler alert. Deuterium can also be obtained from hydrogen but that is the boring method. But reaching the moon is not as simple as simply placing down a rocket and pressing a few buttons. Because in this realistic game, there is advanced rocketry. Meaning there are several torturous ordeals such as designing a rocket with the right amount of thrust without making it too heavy in order to have enough rocket acceleration to reach the moon without running out of fuel which also causes weight. But wait. Rocket fuel was also realistic to make, requiring 7 steps of monochloramine and dimethylamine and blah blah blah. Not to mention making space suits and alloys strong enough to survive the extremes of space. And also concrete. So here is the plan. The first essential essence for rocket fuel is the infamous ammonia. This would require nitrogen, which I already had a handful of from air collection and centrifugation from earlier on. 
I also needed hydrogen from separating water molecules into oxygen and H molecule hydrogen. Both elements are then simply combined together for the ammonia molecule. The next step was relocating some unnecessarily massive storage containers out of the way and extending the cobblestone platform floor base, and creating a variety of several of many chemical reactors. These will be used to create the first two ingredients, methanol and hypochlorous acid, simply by combining several elements together to make the molecule. This created some byproducts which were either useless concomitants flushed down trash cans, or useful byproducts such as hydrochloric acid, to be transported to areas where they will be useful. Next the previously created ammonia was amalgamated with hypochlorous acid to create monochloramine, and even more ammonia was homogenized with methanol to produce dimethylamine. All of the chloramine and methylamine was all thrown together to create 1,1-dimethylhydrazine, which is oxidized to finally create rocket fuel. Upon scooping 1000 milliliters of this substance with a bucket, I did some experimentation. And I discovered that covering myself in rocket fuel gave me jump boost. Which was an absolutely worthless piece of information. Now that I had a way to fuel rockets, it was time to actually make the rocket. But first I needed to make the thing that makes the rocket. And before that I needed to make the thing that enables crafting the thing that forms the rocket. Which is the 5x5 crafting table. This is where the luminescence comes into play. Because by putting this luminescence east of a steel plate and north of a glowstone plate and northeast of an electrum plate, I created these stripy squares, which are infused with two crafting tables to make one crafting table with a 5x5 grid. This new advanced crafting table can combine several medium voltage machine parts and circuits and blah 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 to form the rocket assembling machine. But as it turns out, this is not the only structure needed for making rockets. Because I would also need a launch pad to place a rocket. And launch pads are made out of concrete. Luckily this was easy to create, by simply pouring in water, stone dust, and clay dust into this mixing machine to magically create 1000 degree boiling hot concrete, which can be even more magically transported in this fluid jug. All of this concrete has to be solidified to create concrete platonic solids, which I crushed in its entirety, defeating the entire purpose of making solid concrete. But the redemption came when I magically transformed 9 concrete dust into 9 launch pads, finishing the process. Now I could create the actual rocket. The rocket needs 4 parts. Fuel tanks, thrusters, guidance computers, and a seat. All of these things had one thing in common. They were a real object so they had mass. Meaning I would somehow have to balance mass and thrust and fuel capacity to get a rocket that could make it to the moon without falling back down and potentially killing thousands of civilians. But according to my calculations, this is the simplest rocket that can make it to the moon. There is just one problem. This is extremely expensive. Not only because I needed a plethora of advanced machine parts, but also stainless steel. But this argument is counter-argued by the fact that in previous episodes, I had made a system to automatically smelt a variety of alloys in high demand, so in the time between back then and now, I had passively created hundreds of stainless steel. With more being furnished as I speak. But my counter-argument has a counter-counter-argument. Stainless steel needs four elements. Manganese, chrome, iron, and nickel. Every metal except chrome was easily obtainable due to my deep mob learning resource farm. But chrome only comes from rubies which are expensive to buy. However a holy revelation was bestowed upon me. As you can see here, redstone contains CR8KA chrome. And using a variety of alchemy black magic, I could extract chrome from redstone, which is a good idea since redstone was easily farmable with my deep mob learning resource farm system. The first step in chrome extraction was to centrifuge, aka rapidly rotate until everything comes apart, these 10 redstone dusts to get some mercury, silicon, pyrite, and ruby dust. The mercury will be dumped in this storage container for later use, and all the solids are put in yet another container. Except for the ruby dust, which is stolen towards this electrolyzer, creating 1 chrome per 6 ruby dust. 
So for every 60 redstone, I was getting one chrome. The good part is that I did not have to get rubies manually anymore. Which is good. The last thing to do was to limit chrome production when the system had under 256 redstone, by using this level emitter. Now that stainless steel was 100% automatic mechanized pre-programmed production factory, I could work on the rocket itself. The fuel tanks needed 6 stainless steel inside and also 3 smaller tanks inside, which had 3 glass inside and 4 copper inside and 1 servo inside which had 3 more steel inside and 4 resonating crystal inside which had 1 Restonia crystal inside and 0.125 pearls inside. Making all of these steps within steps within steps was mildly painful, but it was done. The thrusters were similarly made of three smaller thrusters, but these were slightly cheaper, since it only needed conductive iron and red alloys, both of which I had in abundance. The real pain kicks in with the guidance computer, which needed high voltage sensory equipment. All the other things such as high voltage circuits were not much of a problem since they were already automated in the previous episode. But then I realized. The high tier machine parts were simply made out of chrome and stuff that I already had. So I simply dragged everything together and left clicked and left clicked all the things into one guidance computer and left clicked. Now that I had all components to construct the propelled cylindrical projectile, I placed it all down in an orderly fashion and used the rocket assembling machine to turn the rocket into a single entity that could be launched. But just when I thought it was over after creating the rocket, having a successful trip from the Earth to the Moon and back with a rocket was a different story. Because I would need a space suit to not suffer a cruel demise at the hands of asphyxiation, extreme sunburn, debolism, and simultaneous freezing. All of this is prevented with realistic thermal cloth, pressure layers, and radiation layers. This needed some alloys that I already had a lot of from industrialization in previous episodes, but the main problem was cloth. Because it needed string. And the main problem with cloth is this needed string. But after desperately searching around the recipes for a convenient way to produce hundreds of string magically, I had another prophetic vision. You may have remembered all the deforestation I did in the early days of this playthrough. This created a lot of spare saplings that were left unplanted. Apparently I could slash them with this sword to create fibers, which can be 1.5 folded into string. This tactic was severely overpowered. So I proceeded to use it to gain all of the cloth I needed to manufacture the entire space suit. Then I manufactured the actual space suit from the things that created the space suit. I would also need to install an oxygen tank so I could breathe in space. This needed an oxygen tank, and a suit workstation to pinion the tank to become one with the suit. Now I could officially breathe certified oxygen. By now I had all the things I needed to go to the moon. But there were several things I wanted before the incursion of the moon. Because rather than having to go on a rocket trip every time I had to visit the moon, I could simply use dislocators, which were basically checkpoints to teleport back to a location you have traveled to already. These dislocators were formed from chorus fruit and this purple and ore that I am presently collecting as I speak. The only other things I needed were blaze powder and pedestals to hold the dislocators. The final thing I needed was the fueling station, which the quest book demanded me to make. In reality the rocket could be fueled simply by right clicking the rocket with a rocket fuel container. But I was forced to do it the fancy way. Either way the rocket was fueled to the brim with the slightly yellow liquid. Now I had to fill this pad with oxygen to fill my suit with oxygen with the filled pad. But I was backstabbed by the advanced rocketry mod. Because it crashed. So I simply did the same thing I did last time and it miraculously worked. Such is the boundless human spirit. The rocket destination was set to the moon. I right clicked on the rocket. And I pressed space bar. The only thing left to do, was to wait.
For the successful colonization of the moon, I set up the dislocator system, allowing me to materialize back at base so I could grab my handy excavator. I then returned from returning to base, so I could proceed to mine hundreds of moon turf blocks. To turn them into deuterium I would need to crush them extremely hard and centrifuge them even harder to autocratically shake the deuterium molecules into existence and into my hands. With the moon landings and deuterium obtaination a success, I had one new material down, and several more to go. The moon landings were not the first disproportionately large distraction on the journey for the microverse. Like all other multi-block machines, the microverse needs an energy input hatch. Except since it runs at high voltage, it needed a high voltage energy hatch. And for some reason, this needed advanced electronics known as low power integrated circuit. I already had an electronics production set up from the early days of Nomi factory, but this new electronic component needed to be made in some place clean. Where would this clean area possibly be located? The clean room. Which is yet another multi-block whose only purpose is allow the creation of clean room certified required components inside of it. This clean room is made out of two things. Plastic concrete. And plastic concrete with vents. The third thing is stainless steel but I already had that. Anyways I had to make more concrete now. The amounts I needed were beginning to rival the quantities seen by the concrete addiction in immersive engineering. But rather than solidifying it like last time, I would dump this boiling hot concrete in the assembling machine along with plastic and steel frames, to create the prophesized plascrete. The next step was to pry off some rusty metal bars off these abandoned buildings, take some medium voltage machine parts, and more steel, and craft them in Minecraft into filter casings. Notable mention. Crafting the actual clean room controller itself. The next thing to do was to build the clean room, which would be 3x3x3 on the inside. The plascrete would form the outside while the filter casings and clean room controller would go on the top. But in the middle of construction, I was rudely interrupted by the fact that I ran out of materials. I had only created the exact amount specified by the quest, and the book had betrayed us all, aka me. So I returned to the factory to do the process all over again for some fresh plastic concrete. I had just shortly resumed assembling the building when I realized I had miscalculated the amount I needed a second time. When I returned with a few more blocks to fill in the missing edges, as it turns out, I miscalculated a third time. Because I needed a maintenance hatch and a medium voltage energy intake so that the clean room itself could be powered to clean itself. So I created both of these and injected them into the clean room. After placing a door so I could get in, the clean room began functioning, and proceeded to clean the clean room, making it suitable for electronics production. Since the clean room had only 27 cubic Minecraft units of Minecraft volume, space management was crucial, and I would have to engineer a way to fit electronic production setups into this area. This was a compact claustrophobia reference. Anyways for now I would add the laser engraver and cutting machine so that I could at least engrave some silicon wafers and slice them into electronic components. As usual the slicing machine needed a source of water to cut through items. But this made everything as slow as Hubble expansion of space-time, when compared to using lubricant. There are multitudes of ways to produce lubricant, but the funniest method was using fish. Since fish could easily be obtained using my DML system, all I had to do was melt fish into fish oil and distill it into slightly yellower lubricant. But there was one new problem now. How would I transfer the lubricant into this clean room without opening a hole in the wall and causing systematic collapse? The answer, is pass-through hatches. A completely legal and sanitary way to transfer items or fluids in and out without causing systematic collapse. So I used it to smuggle lubricant into the clean room certified cutting machine. The machines in the clean room would be powered using diodes to transfer energy into the room of clean room. With the lubricant and powered machines, I could now create the object I so desired for the microverse high energy voltage hatch. The low power integrated circuit. But since I was in the artificial mood to continue working on electronics, I decided to move the circuit assembling setup inside the room of cleaning, since more advanced circuits later on would also require clean roomification. 
After a while of determining how to make this fit, I came up with a genius dream IQ method. I decided to make this fit inside the clean room. I also somehow found a way to connect everything to the power source, which left enough room to somehow connect it together with the pass-through hatches as well, leaving no spare blocks. And to make it so that I could still craft circuits on demand using the Mi system, I placed an interface next to the pass-through hatch. The circuit components would traverse into the clean room and into the circuit assembling thingies, with the finished product being sucked out of the clean room through yet another pass-through hatch. Now that the whole clean room ordeal was sorted, I could focus on making this peculiar substance, called sodium potassium. A renowned coolant. This coolant is the final thing I needed, alongside the new electronics and some machine casings, to assemble the high voltage energy hatch. With deuterium and the high voltage energy hatch, the path was paved to finally obtain the microverse. So far the quest had taken me to the moon and coincidentally caused an electronics revolution. But this is where it ends. I grabbed some deuterium, steel, redstone, and glowstone, to stuff them inside the blast furnace, which materialized the funny purple deuterium. With these purple bricks, I wrenched them together into purple cubes, which would be the casing of the microverse. Among some other things I needed was this diamond block in particular, glass with temper, maintenance hatches, and input and output hatches so I could put things into the microverse. After putting it all together, the masterpiece was complete. Tens of hours in this digital world had built up to this. The most expensive singular ball in Minecraft was complete. What now? In order to exploit the resources inside the microverse, I would need to send a micro miner, since I could not simply reach inside the multiverse with my hand. But here is the lore behind the microverse, which I completely made up myself. If we do the calculations, diamonds have a density of 3.5 grams per centimeter squared, equating to 3.5 kilograms per 1 cubic meter, aka 1 block, which is the amount seen at the center of the microverse. Since diamond is carbon, 3.5 kilo kilograms divided by the molar mass of carbon is equal to 292,000 moles of carbon, which when multiplied by Avogadro's number, gives 175 octillion carbon atoms. And inside each carbon atom are 12 hadrons, and inside these hadrons are 3 quarks, and inside each quark is probably one universe. Meaning this one diamond block has 6.3 nonillion potential universes, each with their own unique resources and living creatures ranging from dragons to withers and boron to naquata to neutronium, each of which can be harvested and used to feed their factory. This multiverse holds the keys to unlock the gates of late game progression, which need exotic materials that can only be found in the multiverse, and no other place. And as I was saying earlier, to access the multiverse, I needed micro miners to mine its resources for me. The value of the resources mined depended on the tier of the miner that was used. And the tier of the miner depended on the type of guidance system, lasers users to harvest resources, the method used to propel itself, and the material used for the plating. And as you saw 1.6 minutes ago, I programmed a bunch of auto crafting patterns so that the Mi system could create a basic guidance system, some cheap lasers, and a combustion generator. These systems combined created the measly tier 1 micro miner, which was good enough to access titanium and dilithium in the microverse. And since this micro miner ran on combustion, I would need to pump in some spare rocket fuel as miner's fuel source. But there is one extremely sad confidential fact I forgot to share. These miners were one time used. The miner would not return from their heroic ventures to mine resources for me. So for every mission I had to do, I needed to create one, aka one, new micro miner. Which was why I made it so that the Mi system could auto craft them on demand if I needed. The only issue is that each miner cost billions of steel, aka a lot of steel. Usually this was not a problem, but I had a problem. 
the current process to get steel with smelting wrought iron in this measly furnace and alloying it with the massive amounts of carbon I had in the form of diamonds. The issue with the process is that it involves a furnace. Greg Tech offered a far superior alternative. The multi-smelter. A truncated blast furnace that could supposedly smelt 32 things at once in the span of 6 seconds. I did not need it. But I wanted it. Therefore I needed it, to smelt massive amounts of wrought steel in quicker swaths of time. The multi-smelter was rather simple to create. Like any other multi-block it needed input and output hatches as well as maintenance things. The required heat-proof casings and heating coils were rather cheap to manufacture at this point as well. After the completion of those parts all I had to do was assemble them into this multi-smelter. To test if it worked, I fed it 32 elemental iron bars. In approximately 60 blinks of an eye, they were gone. They had all become wrought iron in world record time, or even universe record time. Now that I had ensured easier steel for the endless production of tier 1 miners, it was finally time to send the first micro miner into the microverse. After what felt like 60 seconds of tense waiting, I peeked inside the output hatch to see what I got. And the results did not disappoint. In the midst of all these common ores including salt and uranium and blah blah blah, I had obtained elmenite, the main source of the metal, known as titanium. Not only is this purple and funny, this material is the main material used in extreme voltage machines. And since I also had the clean room for advanced electronics processing and access to the moon for rare moon materials, plus notable mention of titanium, I had everything I needed to steamroll extreme voltage to get closer to my goal of final gregification, which shall be depicted in a future episode of Nomi Factory. This mod pack is based on a community project known as Greg Tech Community Edition unofficial version. If you are an absolute science nerd or absolute programming nerd, and if you wish to contribute knowledge or code to this ever-expanding community project, then check the links in the description and join us immediately. And if you wish to play Nomi Factory with friends and create mind-boggling factories with the squad, click this other link in the description for cheap and reliable Minecraft servers from Bisect Hosting, using code IGBLON for a discount. With that out of the way, shout out to the channel members of the past.